All right, turn to Matthew 12. We left off with Jesus speaking to the multitudes of people there in the last few verses of chapter 11, where he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As we saw, Jesus was offering the people true rest in him. He says, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And this was in contrast to the heavy burden that the Pharisees were placing, the heavy burden of the law that they were placing upon the people of Israel. And remember what Paul said about the law of God, the law of Moses. 1 Timothy 1, 8, Paul writes, But we know that the law is good <clears throat> if one uses it lawfully. In other words, the lawful way to use the law of God is to prove to people from the Old Testament that we are sinners who need a Savior, that we, are, um, we fall short of the glory of God. You know, the, another way to say it is the law of God was never given to us to make us righteous, but the law was given to show us how unrighteous we are. But the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, as Galatians 3 tells us. And once we come to Christ, we're no longer under the tutor, the law. Paul says it like this in Romans 3.19. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Because that's what the law shows us. We're guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, in other words, if you're trying to work out your own salvation by keeping the law or work for it, he says, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So again, the law tells us we are sinful human beings, but it points us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can fulfill every part, every jot and tittle of the law Jesus fulfilled perfectly in our place. He's the substitute in, in so many ways for us. Here's where the religious leaders in Israel made a huge mistake. They wrongly believed that they could make themselves righteous if they just tried harder to keep and live up to the perfect standards of the law. Then they wrongly taught the people that if you can live up to the perfect standards of the law, you just might make it in also. You know, you can stand before God in your own righteousness, but obviously nobody could. And so this is why Jesus said to the burdened down, heavy laden people, come to me and I will give you rest. Remember, the Hebrew word for Sabbath is Shabbat, Shabbat, and it means rest. And that's what Jesus gives us, is true rest. As we come into chapter 12, he's going to confront the religious leaders who are accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. You might feel like, well, I mean, people accuse me of breaking the Sabbath all the time. I know people in these different religions, and they're saying we are breaking the Sabbath because we're here on Sunday. Well, Jesus will deal with these things as we go through this section of Scripture. Here we see Jesus straightening out their misunderstandings concerning the real meaning of Shabbat, the Sabbath. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 12, it says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So he's walking through the fields, and again the Pharisees said you could only walk so many steps in the Sabbath, and if you walk over this amount of steps, then you're breaking the law. Well, Jesus is out here walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry. Remember what he said, Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, burdened down. So they're hungry, and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look! Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Again, the Pharisees had come up with almost 1,500 additional laws concerning just the Sabbath law. Now, the Sabbath is very simple. The fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but at the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. We saw last time, last week, Exodus 31, 
God specifically tells this to the Jewish people. He says, this is a covenant between me and the children of Israel. He says that numerous times in that section. It's not for everybody. It was a covenant between God and the children of Israel. As we'll see, it all comes down to your definition of work. Again, the Israelites were being crushed by all the legalistic um, practices, the legalistic requirements that the Pharisees were putting upon them. And so when they accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath law here, because they're walking through the grain field, they're, you know, kind of taking your hand on the, a stalk of wheat, and you just kind of take it off, and you got the you know, kernels in your hand, and they would rub it in their hands. That was threshing the wheat, separating the wheat from the chaff, and then you would blow off the chaff, and then you got these kernels in your hand, and you pop it in your mouth and eat them. So they're accusing the disciples who are doing this of breaking the Sabbath law. They're harvesting, they're you know, threshing, they're winnowing. Again, all they did was pluck a few stalks of you know, wheat, let's say, grain, and rub it in their hands and pop it in their mouth. According to God's law, that's exactly what you could do. Look at these verses from Deuteronomy 23, verses 24 and 25. God says, When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in your container. In other words, you couldn't go through the vineyard and just have these giant baskets and start loading up your neighbor's grapes into your you know, basket and take them home. But you could walk through there, and as many as you could pluck and eat, you could do that. And then it goes on to say, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, that's what they're doing here, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle of your neighbor uh, on your neighbor's standing grain. In other words, you couldn't go in there with a combine and level the field and take all of his grain. But that's the heart of God. He's the one who says, I will give you rest. And so as you're passing through your neighbor's field, it says they're weary, they're tired, they're hungry. And so if you're going through their vineyard, you could, you know, take some of the grapes. God is saying, and this is what he is, the whole purpose of what he was saying to the Israelites so many years ago. I'm God, you're hungry, take, eat. I've blessed that neighbor. That's why they've got so much, you know, wheat. That's why they've got so many grapevines. They're just producing. I'm the God of the harvest. I'm the one that blesses them. And so that was God's welfare system as well. They would go through the field, especially if they were hungry, they were poor, and they could just glean from the neighbor's field. After the harvest took place, the poor people would come into the fields. They would glean what was left in the vine or in the corners of the field. Leviticus talks about this. Leviticus 19, verse 10. The Lord's instruction is, you shall not glean. This is what he's telling the farmers, the, the guys growing all the crops and so forth. You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard, you shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So here's the Lord's disciples. They're hungry. Now, pause there for a moment. This is interesting to me because here's Jesus. He could feed 5,000 hungry men, plus their wives, plus their kids, with a little boy's lunch. No big deal. He's prayed over it, blessed it, and it just kept coming out. The baskets keep filling up and, you know, fish and loaves, and they just keep game coming. And it's like Thanksgiving meal. They had their stretchy pants on because at the end of that, it says they were all full, and it means full to the max. I mean, they weren't just getting a little crumb. They were just stuffing themselves. Here's the disciples, and they're hungry. Why didn't Jesus just multiply something for them? Because God works the way He wants to work. He does things the way He wants to do things. He has something more important to teach them at this time. Again, Jesus can do above and beyond all that we could hope or imagine, but oftentimes the most important lessons we learn from the Lord are in the simple, normal things of life. Sometimes we want big, miraculous, powerful, you know, earthquakes, fire, lightning, that's God working. And other times, 
God will work in very simple ways. One of my favorite stories that goes along with this is in 1 Kings chapter 19. This is dealing with Elijah as he is running from Queen Jezebel. He hides in a cave. In 1 Kings 19, look at verse 11. Then he, God, says to Elijah here, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That's when the Lord spoke to Elijah. Yes, God can get through to us in the big, loud, miraculous ways, but if we're walking in the Spirit, He can speak to us in the simple quietness of just being in the Word, opening the Word, and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. He can do it quietly. He can do the fire and lightning and earthquake. He can do the big stuff, obviously, but don't just keep looking for that. You might miss that still, small voice of what the Lord has for you and the simplicity and purity of your devotion to Christ. So many people miss out the still small voice because they're looking for something bigger. Well, that can't be God speaking to me. It must be crazy Joe Biden talking like this. <laughs> That's not the Lord talking to me like this. Be careful. <laughs> and psh, stupid, sorry. One of those things you it's best left in my brain. Anyway, God can speak to you quietly. He can speak to you loudly, but just be open to what he wants to do. So watch how Jesus responds to these guys. And you kind of wonder where, what these Pharisees were doing. Were they hiding, you know, in the bushes there, hiding in the grain field? And it's like, aha, we caught you eating grain. I mean, whatever they're doing, Jesus responds, verse three, but he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Now, when Jesus says, have you not read, it speaks of the fact that even though these Pharisees knew a lot about the Bible, they didn't really know the Bible. They didn't know their scriptures. They didn't understand the things of the Lord. And that's true of a lot of people who know a lot of things about God. They might know a lot of stuff about Jesus, but they don't know the Lord. They don't have a personal relationship with Him. Jesus will say this on a, on a few occasions when He says, Have you not read? When I was a new believer, I heard someone say this, and it stuck with me. It says, um, It's good to know the Word of God, but what is most important is to know the God of the Word. It's good to know the Word of God, but it's more important to know the God of the Word. Jesus says it like this in John 5, verse 38. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, whom God sent, that's Jesus, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures. That's what these Pharisees, they knew a lot of scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So what an indictment against those who study the Bible, but they never come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Here's how the Apostle Paul says it. He brings this accusation against these people. 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I've met a number of people like this. They're always learning, always digging in deeper, but they don't know Jesus. They can quote a lot of Bible verses, but they don't know the Lord. How do I know that? Because they're acting and living contrary to the Word of God. They're doing everything contrary to what Jesus has revealed to us. They might know a lot of stuff, but they don't know the God of the Word. They're always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, and that's the whole point of God's Word. The Word of truth points us to Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. Jesus prays, sanctify them in truth. Your Word is truth. 
In these verses in Matthew, Jesus uses the example of David as he and his men are they're, they're running from the wrath of King Saul who is trying to throw his spear at David and just pin him up against the wall. He was jealous of David because David's been anointed king. David wasn't in that capacity as king yet, and so he's fleeing because Saul is after him. And so David and his men, they come to the tabernacle, and they were hungry. Uh, the, the high priest Ahimelech was there, and he said, we don't have any food. All we got is this showbread. Remember, they would make 12 loaves for each of the 12 tribes. They would do it every morning, put out fresh loaves of bread, and then the priests alone could eat the showbread after it was removed, and then they could eat it. Well, that's all they had. So David says, we're hungry. And the high priest says, well, here, this is what I've got. You eat the showbread. It was not lawful, but God's law was never intended to inflict hardship upon his people. And so mercy was extended to David and his men over the ceremonial law of God. So look at verse 5. Jesus again says, Or have you not read... You don't even know your own scriptures. Have you not read in the law that the Sabbath, that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? He, he points out the fact that these temple priests are profaning or desecrating the Sabbath. Every Saturday, they're desecrating, profaning it. And yet, he says, they're blameless. In other words, Jesus says they're blameless because they're serving the Lord. They're, they're doing what they're doing as unto the Lord. And here's why. Because on the Sabbath day, these priests had to sacrifice twice as many animals. So you had a bunch of priests on the temple. He's talking about the temple here in Jerusalem. On the Temple Mount, they got this big giant altar where they're doing the sacrifices, on the, you know, putting the animal on it, burning them up. So you had people all day long running up with sticks, Logs to keep that fire burning. They're slitting the animal, putting them on the sacrifice. It was ongoing throughout the day. A lot of work was being done in sacrificing the animals. And so on the one hand, they were violating the Sabbath laws by doing work on the Sabbath. But on the other hand, they were doing the work of the Lord on the Sabbath. Even though they're blameless, he says, because they were serving the Lord. In this same scene, when you look at Mark chapter 2, verse 27, this is when Jesus also says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God gave the Sabbath to be a blessing for his people, but the religious leaders had turned the blessing into a burden upon the people. So Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, as we'll see in a moment. Verse 6, he says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. In other words, if the priests serving the Lord are blameless, then my disciples are blameless because one greater than the temple, Jesus himself, is there and they're serving Jesus. To say it another way, if the priests are blameless, as they serve the Lord on the Sabbath, how much more blameless are Jesus' disciples who are serving Jesus personally? Common sense. Verse 7. But if you had known what this means, again, accusing them of not knowing what the Scriptures say, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the second time Jesus quotes Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. We saw it earlier. He talks about the same thing. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Mercy supersedes sacrifice. Grace, love, compassion takes precedence over our works of sacrifice. When Jesus says here, for the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, at this point in his ministry, this is the most radical thing he has said, because he's saying, I'm the one who created the Sabbath. Who created the Sabbath law? It was God. Fourth commandment. Jesus says, that's me. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He's claiming equality with the Father here. Again, this is Jesus saying that he is the creator 
He created the Sabbath to be a blessing to the people. It was to be a time of rest, a time of refreshing, not a time of burden like the Pharisees were making it. And so the awesome thing to see here is that Jesus used the Word of God from Hosea to validate his own actions. And notice he brings up in this section King David. I emphasize King. He brings up the high priest, the priests in the temple, king, priests. And then he quotes from the prophet, Hosea, Jesus being the ultimate king, priest, and prophet over all. He is Lord of all. Now watch as he gives us another demonstration of this truth. Verse 9. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Now when you put Matthew and Mark and Luke's accounts together of this story, we're told that Jesus goes into the synagogue and he starts to teach the people in the synagogue. And as we'll see here, this is when the religious leaders really start to turn against Jesus. This is really the beginning of when their animosity towards him really takes root and, and they're out to destroy him. Look at verse 10. And behold, there is a man who had a withered hand. It means it was useless. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That's what they're asking Jesus. Because they knew what he was going to do. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Now again, in Mark and Luke's gospel, it says the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely to see whether Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. That, that's the whole narrative. So what a contrast between Jesus and religion. Religion is looking closely at Jesus to try to find fault in him. Religion is looking closely at you just trying to find fault. That's easy. You can look at me in five minutes. Yeah, there's a lot of faults there. I mean, that's no big deal. But Jesus is looking at people so he can heal them, so he can change their hearts, so he can bless them, he can strengthen them, forgive them. He's looking for ways to do something wonderful in our lives. He's not looking to accuse us because we're already guilty. Now, it's Dr. Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He tells us it was this man's right hand that was withered. Why is that significant? Because in that culture, especially, the right hand was the hand of work, the hand of power, the hand of authority. It was your right hand, and most people then were right-handed. You're never told it's your right hand unless it was significant. Because like the left-handed guys, they were kind of weird. Their southpaws were just looked at as weird. I mean, that's the way it was. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's at the right hand of power, the right hand of glory. Anyway, here's this guy whose right hand is withered. It means it's, literally means it's useless. But how sad. These hard-hearted religious leaders knew that Jesus wanted to heal this man. They just were waiting for him. That's why they asked, is it lawful to heal somebody on the Sabbath? The amazing thing to me is they could not do anything to help this poor guy. Plus, if they could help him, they would not help him because it was the Sabbath. That's how hard-hearted they were. And they resent Jesus because he could help this man, and he would help this man on the Sabbath. Again, Mark and Luke's gospel, this is when Jesus tells this poor man, Stand up and come forward. And so they're in a synagogue. They'd have people sitting on both sides facing the middle. And so Jesus is like calling him out. Stand up, come forward. And so now this guy's standing in the middle of the synagogue. Now, I'm sure if we could go back there and be in that scene and look at these Pharisees, their faces are probably turning red. I mean, if possible, there'd be steam coming out of their ears and nostrils. I mean, they were very, very mad at this, as we'll see in a moment. This is how crazy things were in Israel at this time. Can you heal this guy on the Sabbath? We'll see Jesus can. For them, if you cut your arm, cut your hand on the Sabbath, you could not apply pressure to your arm to stop the bleeding unless they thought you might bleed out. Only then could you put pressure on it. If you fell and you broke your arm on the Sabbath, you could not get it set until Sunday. It's just crazy to me. That's how they looked at it. They, they become all so religious. 
You'd have to wait till the next day, leaving your brother, your sister in agony? Just think of how these religious leaders were doing everything they could think of in order to not break the Sabbath laws. But again, it was the farthest thing from the heart of God towards his people. This is Jesus, and this is why he says to these broken, hurting, desperate people, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, true Sabbath rest. So verse 11, Then he said to them, to these religious leaders, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? So you have a little lamb that falls into a hole, a ditch, and it's sitting there. It's in the middle of summer. It can be easily 105 degrees there in Israel. And that thing's like, meh, meh, meh. You know, he can say, well, one of you guys wouldn't reach down there and grab that lamb and pull it out on the Sabbath. Every one of them said, well, yeah, that poor little lamb, we're not going to listen to it just, uh, and then die. They wouldn't think of such a thing. Crazy, verse 12. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So, Again, he's challenging their faulty thinking. All of you would pull a sheep out of the pit on the Sabbath, but you won't set a broken bone? You, you won't put a bandage around somebody's bleeding arm? Do you see something wrong with this way of thinking? The downfall of legalism is that it hardens your heart to the ways of God. It keeps you from loving people. It keeps you from caring for people. It's more concerned about me not doing what's wrong instead of, Lord, use me to bless others. Like these Pharisees, you'll end up with a critical heart if you stay legalistic. Guess what that leads to? You'll become more concerned about your pets. Don't want to you know, make anybody upset. You'll become more concerned about your pets than about people. That's where hard-heartedness will be an issue in your life. You'll end up wanting to save the whales, which is fine, but you could care less about babies dying in the womb, being slaughtered. 60 million plus now in our nation since 1973. That should grieve us? That, that's you know, a strike against our nation? God will hold us accountable for that? Sure, we should try to save the whales. Big deal. That's great. But be careful with this. That's why Jesus says here, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep. And you can replace sheep with any other animal. After all, only human beings have been created in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. We've been created in the image and likeness of God. We have a spirit that will dwell either with the Lord for eternity or separated from the Lord for eternity. Animals don't have a spirit. That's the difference. At the same time, God's word is clear he put us in charge over His creation. We're to be good stewards over this planet. That's why we don't go around trashing things. That's why we don't go around burning up buildings and you know just looting and stealing. And you know, I mean, this is God's world. This is His creation. He wants us to be good stewards. We don't go burn up forests. We'll let God do that, and He will. This is His planet. And here's something to consider. We're spending trillions of dollars. Well, they want us to spend trillions of dollars on the New Green Deal. Guess what, folks? Book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18, tells us that God, in His judgment for a seven-year period, He is going to wipe out every animal in the sea. Every ocean will be destroyed. All the green grass will be burned up. All the green trees in the world will be burned up. This is part of his judgment. Jesus is going to come back, chapter 19 of Revelation. He's going to restore this world. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden for a limited time for 1,000 years. But then at the end of that 1,000 years, guess what God does? To Mother Earth, <laughs> he obliterates it. Literally, it vaporizes Read 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. He goes through that whole thing. It's going to melt with fervent heat. 
It's all going to be rolled up like a scroll. It's all going to melt. It's going to be done away with. But he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell forever. So don't put all your hope in the things of this world. Yes, we're to be good stewards, but be careful. It's a very slippery slope when people will stop worshiping the Creator and they start worshiping creation. There's a lot of people, evolutionists, that are worshiping creation and they've put away the Creator. Paul warns us, this is in Romans chapter 1. I encourage you to read the whole chapter starting in verse 18, but this is the devolution of man. You know, man wants to evolve, we're getting better, we're getting greater. No. This is what God says, we're going down the tubes, we're not going up. Romans 1.22, professing to be wise. I always thought, man, this would be great to give CMU professors. Professing to be wise, they became fools, unless they're believers, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchange the truth of God for the lie. The truth of God is He's the creator of all things. The truth of God is Jesus is the only way to heaven. The lie, and this is why it's emphatic here, the lie means the lie that Satan the serpent gave to Eve in the garden. Oh, God won't judge you. You won't die. You'll be just like God. That's the lie that you don't need God. You can evolve into something better. You don't need God. You are a God. Just look within yourself. You don't need God. The lie is, Satan's lie, that God is irrelevant. We can do it on our own. That's the lie. They've exchanged the truth of God, who He is, what He's done for us through Jesus, for the lie. And the real result is, they worshiped and served the creature. They worshiped themselves. Look in the mirror. Oh, I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. No, yeah, right. It's, it's just a lie. Rather than, instead of worshiping the Creator, so worship and serve the creature, the creation, rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 13. So here's this guy standing in the middle of the synagogue. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Again, they're accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, working on the Sabbath. Now, when you think about this, how much work did Jesus do to heal this man? He didn't do anything. Stretch out your hand, it's all shriveled up, and he stretches it, and then it's instantly healed. He didn't do anything. He didn't work. That wasn't any work for him. He just tells the guy, stretch out your hand, and instantly it's restored to perfect health like his left hand. Think about this. The human hand is made up of 27 bones, 27 joints, 34 muscles, over 100 ligaments and tendons, plus all the nerves and vessels that run through your hand. Instantly, without any surgery, without any rehab, this guy's withered hand, and it means it was, it was just pretty much shriveled up to nothing. It's just instantly healed. Awesome. I'm sure everybody in that synagogue was just like, wow. This is awesome. This is great. Except for one class of people, the Pharisees. Not everybody's happy with Jesus. Look at verse 14. This blows my mind. Then the Pharisees went out, and they go out of the synagogue, and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Apparently, it's okay to plot murder on the Sabbath. Just don't plot doing anything good on the Sabbath. How ironic. How moronic. This is the nature and character of Jesus. He's looking for ways to bless, to heal, to comfort, so that they can experience true Sabbath rest. But the religious leaders are looking for opportunities how they might destroy Jesus. Again, that's the contrast between the world and Satan and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The world and Satan, they plot death. Jesus, they plot life. The Father, Son, Spirit, they're plotting life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus summarizes this truth. He says, The thief, that's Satan, does not come except to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. That's what these guys are plotting, how to destroy him. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That's the ministry of Jesus. Now, remember when Jesus was, well, he was baptized. He goes out in the wilderness. He's tempted by Satan after 40 days fasting. And one of the first things he does, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, and he goes into the synagogue of Nazareth, and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. Now, remember when a few years ago we had the scroll, the great scroll of Isaiah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The original copy is in... Um, what is it called? The museum, the, the museum of the book there in Jerusalem. And it's 25 feet long. Well, when they first unrolled it, and it's dated about 250 BC, when they first unrolled this Dead Sea, it was 25 feet long. And one of the guys that was part of that project, he took pictures all the way down of it. And the negative sat in this box for like 50 years. And they found these negatives and they're like, what is this? And then they're like, this is the great scroll of Isaiah. So they made three copies from those negatives that were exact replica of the great you know, scroll of Isaiah. So we had it here at the church. It's pretty cool. And it, it literally went the whole length of the stage. And scrolls, they'd be rolled up in the middle. So they hand this scroll to Jesus. And remember, they didn't have chapters and verses. And so it says, he found the place where it was written of him. So he's got to go... Keep going to what we call chapter 61. And he gets to the end of there and he, and he opens it up. And this is what he reads. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Again, the summary of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. That can be both physical and spiritual blindness. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. So there's people that are, you know, they need to be set free from oppression. There's people that need to be set free because they're captive to the things of this world, the sins of this world. So Jesus is here to set captives free. Set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to him. He didn't quote the very next verse, which talks about the judgment of God and, and the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's at his second coming. But there he was saying, this is why I'm here, to heal broken hearts, preach the gospel to the poor, open blind eyes, set captives free. Isn't that a wonderful ministry? Do you remember... What the people tried to do with Jesus right after he handed the scroll back to them. And he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. It says the people got mad at him. They hauled him to, and a couple years ago we were in Nazareth, and there's a giant cliff there. They hauled him to the edge of the cliff, and they're getting ready to throw him off the cliff. And it says he just disappeared in their midst. He just kind of walked right past them. They didn't throw him up. But that was because he was saying, I'm here to bless, I'm here to heal, I'm here to restore and they still hated him. Guess what? The world is plotting today. It's plotting against Jesus. They're still trying to destroy him and his followers. Today, there are governments and political leaders who are plotting against Jesus and his church. There's governors in our country. They're plotting against Jesus and his church. There are mayors in some of the big cities that are plotting against Jesus and his church. Don't forget, just last year, they plotted, we're going to keep all the liquor stores open. We're going to keep all the pot shops open. We're going to keep all the casinos open. No, but we've got to close those churches down. They're plotting. Scientists today are plotting against him. They deny all the evidence of creation and the evidence of a designer even the digital code within our DNA proves that evolution could never happen. And yet they try to deny it. God designed us with meaning and purpose. And just like in Jesus' day, there are many religious leaders who are plotting against Jesus and his followers as they deny the word of God 
or they change the word of God. And we see this all the time. People adding to God's word, people taking away from God's word. They're plotting against Jesus. And there are a lot of people and institutions that are plotting against the Lord, but guess what? They have always failed. And they will always fail. Remember what Jesus says? We'll look at it when we get to chapter 16. Jesus says, I will build my church, his people, born again, blood-bought, I'll build my church in the gates of hell. Hades will not, shall not prevail against it. Even in Jesus' day, these religious leaders will plot against the Lord and will even get the Roman Empire to conspire against him. They will think they got away with it as they beat Jesus after arresting him, as they torture him, as they nail him to the cross, as they watch him bleed out and die, stick the spear into his heart, and out comes blood and water. And they thought, we did it. We destroyed him. Little did they know, the grave couldn't stop him. Death couldn't hold him. He rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. He ascended back up into glory. And even now, as country after country tries to stop Jesus, tries to stop his church, I was just reading this a couple of weeks ago. What's going on in China right now is truly amazing. They're saying, they're guesstimating 50,000 Chinese are coming to Christ every single week. Not every year, not every month, every week, 50,000 Chinese coming to Christ. You know what the fastest per, per capita, the fastest growing church in the world right now is in Iran. Amazing. The underground church is growing like crazy. And it's just, you don't hear it reported, but that's what the Lord is doing in these last days. No matter how many world leaders plot against Jesus and his church, Jesus is gathering his bride from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group, and he's about to blow the trumpet and call his bride home to be with him in glory, and then we will experience the greatest peace, the greatest rest, like nothing we've ever imagined. In the middle of all this turmoil and insanity that is all around the world today, Jesus still tells us, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So while the Pharisees are plotting how they might destroy Jesus, notice what Jesus does, verse 15. And when he knew it, that they're plotting against him, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him. And he healed them all from Sunday through the next Sabbath. Every day, he didn't, they didn't stop him. And yet he warned them not to make him known now, that does not mean that Jesus was shielding himself from danger. He's simply saying these things to them because he doesn't want the people to come and take him by force. And John, it says they're wanting to make him king, to take him by force. Here, the, the reasoning behind this is they, didn't, they were trying to set him up to be a revolutionary hero. Everybody wants a hero. They want Jesus to be a revolutionary hero. In other words, we want Jesus to kick out the Roman Empire. We want him to shed the Roman Empire's blood. That's not why he came. He came to be a revolutionary hero in shedding his own blood, dying in our place. So Matthew ties all this in with a prophecy from Isaiah. Remember, Matthew quotes more from the Old Testament scriptures than any of the other four, three Gospels, all four Gospels, quote Old Testament scriptures, but Matthew the most, he says in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles, that's you and me, he will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets, in other words, this prophecy identified the ministry of the Messiah, what his first coming would be like, meek and mild. Yeah, we saw, we'll see him flip over money changers' tables, but that's not why he was here. The Holy Spirit was upon him, again, to lead him to heal broken hearts, broken lives. He was not here to be a screaming revolutionary. He wasn't trying to rally the troops. He wasn't out on some main street somewhere with a bullhorn. All right, we're going to storm the gates. We're going to take over this country. That wasn't him. He wasn't trying to whip the people into a frenzy. 
This is all, these, these verses are all about his first coming, what his ministry was. Look at verse 20. This is awesome. Of Jesus, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Focus on verse 20 here for a moment as I wrap it up, because this is one of the most beautiful pictures of his nature and his character. This shows us how he plots to bless people. He plots to give us life. He's not plotting death, but not like the Pharisees. First of all, it says a bruised reed he will not break. You know, picture a long, wispy reed, you know, growing you know, alongside of the water somewhere along a river, or lake. You know, like a big cattail standing straight up. A bruised reed he won't break. In other words, what's going to bruise that reed? Well, a windstorm can come and just kind of hangs over. Or, you know, somebody steps on it and it kind of just flops over. You know, waves could crash against it and knock it over. So the picture is Jesus is not going to see that and like snap it off and throw it away. A bruised reed, it says he will not break. The picture of him is he straightens it up, he wraps around it so it'll stand strong once again. That's the picture he gives us of his ministry. A smoking flax, that's like the wick in an oil lamp. A smoking flax means it's run out of oil, it, it's about to go out, there's a little puff of smoke still coming from the wick, the, the flax. So the picture is he, re, he puts oil back into it and he starts to bl breathe on it. There's other pictures in the Old Testament where that's what they would do. They'd start whoo, breathe into it to try to fan it back into flame. That's Jesus and what he's doing with us. You might be down, you might be discouraged, you might be feeling like, I'm on my last leg, I'm on my last breath, you know, and he's like whoosh, trying to fan you back into flame. He won't quench you. He's not like, you're done. <laughs> Until you're done, you're not done. Until he takes you home, you still got things to do. He doesn't break us off and cast us away. He doesn't crush out the tiny flame that's about to go out. If we let him, he will reignite our hearts. He will heal and mend what's broken in our lives. And that happens primarily as we just humble ourselves before him and admit, Lord, I've sinned. We repent, whatever it might be. He cleanses our hearts. He washes us with the living water of his word, the living water of the Holy Spirit through his blood that cleanses us of all sin. And He refills us overflowing with His Spirit so we can shine brightly. We can be the light and salt that He wants us to be. So again, a beautiful section of Scripture. Don't be afraid of what the world is plotting against you. But be excited that Jesus is plotting abundant life for you. Because no matter what the world does, Jesus wins. Bottom line.